It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Gay Culverhouse. Uh, of course, uh, fans down in the Tampa Bay area remember her. She was the president of the Bucks for uh, about 10 years, and uh, since then uh, she has gone on to uh, really be an advocate for uh, safety in the uh, sport of football. She's written a uh, new book, which is getting a lot of uh, press, and we want to invite her on tonight. It's called Throwaway Players, the Concussion Crisis. She's also uh, put together an organization that uh, helps the players after they retire. Uh, we'll find out about that as well. And Dr. Culverhouse joins us uh, by telephone today. Thank you for being with us tonight. How are you? Thank you. Oh. I'm doing very well. I appreciate the invitation to join you. Yeah, it's good to have a chance to, to talk to you, and, and uh, obviously this has been uh, being talked about for uh, the last uh, couple of years, really, uh, uh, probably more than in, in the past, maybe 40 or 50 years uh, of the National Football League with uh, concussions. Uh, we're seeing a lot in all sports, but particularly in football. We're seeing uh, sports being more careful about it, but uh, I guess it really hasn't uh, taken hold yet because uh, we see a lot of uh, you know kind of sad stories, don't we, of, of football players that have had multiple concussions and, and what happens when they leave the game, right? Exactly. Exactly, and that's what we founded the uh, Gay Call Player Outreach Program to match players who have concussions or other injuries with programs that the NFL provides for them. And so many players, once they leave a team, get lost to the system. They don't leave a forwarding address with the NFL. And so the NFL has a lot of programs injuries and heart screening, prostate screening, um, you know, uh, gosh, just many programs for concussion awareness and for assisted living facilities, knee replacement, back surgery, but these players don't know it. And so they suffer in silence. And we go out and speak around the country and inform retired players what their benefits are and then help them to receive them. Doctor, I, I have to think this is a little bit analogous to what happened with P. Lorelein's company in the tobacco industry. They went for a long, long time saying that nothing was wrong with smoking and spent all the money they possibly could to deter any kind of investigation that would eliminate smoking in this country. And I think the same thing has happened in the National Football League. I know you're talking about all these things that are available to the players, but we have known for a long, long time that the helmets aren't adequate. In fact, most of the insurance companies won't even insure uh, the folks that are making the helmets any longer. And the National Football League continues to say, uh, yes, we have a problem, uh, but in the case of uh, Mackey and a few others, uh, you know, they acknowledge that it's a problem, but they don't acknowledge it's their fault. Well, I don't know if I agree with you, quite honestly. Um, okay. I testified before Congress um, in October of '09 and heard from Eleanor Profeta and Chris Nowinski and Bob Cantu and the experts, if you will, and the NFL was there, and I will say that the doctor, the neurologist that the NFL was using at the time, they put a lot of faith in. And those of us around the table did not find him credible. But that doesn't mean there aren't two sides to the research. Um, we didn't find him credible, but by the same token, in 1970, no one really thought that being hit on the head was anything more than a ding. Right. It was a zinger, it was a ding, it was your clock was wrong, you saw a double for a while, your vision was blurred, your teammates steered you to the correct huddle, and you went on with the game. And no I one agree with that 100%, Doctor. I agree with that 100%, doctor, but you're 40 years later now. You're 40, you're 40 years I later. Will, yes. That's absolutely correct. And now when Rich McKay puts in a rule to make the game safer, do you know who complains the most? I do not. The fans. The fans are the ones that complain the most. Every time there is a rule put in place to make the game safer, the people that are the angriest are the fans. Well, they and changed the rule the about the kickoff this year, and I haven't heard I haven't heard one fan complain about the change in the kickoff rule. The only person the only well, persons that I've heard complain about it are the coaches. Well, you don't get the call. 
calls I get, apparently. Okay. How about the how about the helmet manufacturers? How, how come they knew that they couldn't insure the helmets 35 and 40 years ago? And, and you're talking about 1960, and I agree with you. Everybody thought it was a dinger. Everybody thought it was, you know, all kinds of things at that point. But as I say, we're 40, That's 50 right. years later, and you haven't been able to get any insurance on helmets for years. Well, you know that Udall has put up a bill to set up an agency to do standardization of helmets and to do certification, sort of like the FDA does on food and drugs. And so if that will pass, that will be a great start. But it's an unregulated industry. Now that a lot of people are against regulation, you know that. People say government should stay out of our lives. And so it's very difficult to get something like that regulated. Does it need to be? Absolutely. Will it save a lot of kids' brains? Absolutely. But moms think, Quite honestly, if they put a helmet on their kid, their kid's head is safe. All it is is safe from fracture. It's not safe from concussion. Very true. I agree with that 100%. And as I say, but it's been a long time. This is not something that you and I are talking about, and your book that's being released is focusing on. It's something that uh, has been discussed and talked about, and certainly in the insurance industry it's been going on for for 35 or 40 years as to how you know reliable these helmets have really become and uh it just seems to me that uh, the national football league has known for a long period of time as you say uh what the effectiveness of, of those helmets really is i don't know that that's true quite honestly because the the neurologist they were using. Now then they could have chosen a different neurologist and they have now Rick Ellenbogen is their new neurologist who's counseling them and they're putting out different words to the players now. I mean, they, the entire culture of football has changed because of concussions. Um, and you would be surprised. It's, it's 180 degrees from when the other Kaysen, our Kaysen, was the neurologist advising them. And when they dropped him and got a different neurologist advising them, the entire culture changed. And so now, well, if you go into the locker room, you will see signs and posters about reporting your concussion. You have to, you have to, mandatory that you leave the field. You cannot return that day. You have to be totally observed by a neurologist and certified Correct. okay to play again. So Correct. that wasn't there two years ago. Well, let me you ask know, you this. I, I don't want to be, ar be argumentative because your book, your book is, is going to touch on all the important factors. But if you could just finish the player negotiations with the owners a month ago, and they can have 60 lawyers around the table advising everybody what to do. You're going to tell me they can only afford to have one neurologist to tell them what to do about helmet destruction? <laughs> quite honest, I mean, they got 60 honestly, lawyers at the table. Listen, quite honestly, all you need is one bright neurologist to set the record straight. That's all you really need. And if you look at someone like Ann McKee, who is autonomous brain, and looking at CTE, and if you look at the top people in the field, Bob Cantu, Bob Stern, Rick Ellenbogen, they now have the top people. The NFL funded a million dollars to Boston University for research that went to Ann McKee, Bob Cantu, and Chris Nowinski. They did it for the concussion research, and they hired Rick Ellenbogen to advise them. They've got the top of the top now. Yes, they made a mistake in hiring who they hired, but they didn't know they hired the wrong person. But when they found out he was giving them bad advice, they got it together and hired the correct group and then funded them. So, you know, there are a lot of things I'll take issue with with the NFL, believe me. But I have to honestly say they tried on this. 
Talking with Dr. Gay Culverhouse. The name of the book is Throwaway Players, The Concussion uh, Crisis. And, uh, Doctor, uh, obviously it's going to be a, a harder sell, I think, for the, the, the professional game to, to maybe take care of this problem. But I think you, you talk about it in the book, I believe, uh, uh, down to the high school, maybe even to the, you know, the, the kids playing Pop Warner football. That's really where this has to start now, doesn't it? Yes. I start with peewee football in the book. And even at that level, at that age, uh, I mean, even though the kids aren't as big, right, I mean, they, they can still suffer from, uh, from head injuries, can't they, even wearing helmets? Well, of course. I mean, of course they can. And it's not just football. Um, the largest contributor in girls' sports is basketball and soccer. And it's not the obvious thing of hitting the ball with your head. It's running into the other player head-on-head -head injury to the other player. And in basketball, it's the quick stops, the starts and the stops, which have the effect of sloshing your brain from the front to the back, which is a whiplash, which is a concussion. So there are all sorts of ways you can get these concussions. You don't have to have helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact to have a concussion. What was the uh, advice to the neurologists in terms of the soccer and the, and primarily the basketball, which we're much more familiar with? Uh, uh, what was the result of their studies there? The Rick Ellenbogen only works for the NFL. I mean, I, I can tell you what a number of neurologists think, but I'm not talking about the football neurologists now. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, what, imma yeah. immaterial what neurologists, I'm just saying, you, you said basketball and soccer were two other leading uh, basketball. Right. I worked in the NBA for a long time. I don't remember reading too many concussions that were uh, a result of basketball other than, as yeah. you say, head-to-head -head contact. Yeah, well, the, the main problem in basketball is the, the whiplash effect. Like I mentioned, the brain, you know, when you... If you think of Newton's laws, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. When you are running down the court and then you run into someone or you trip and fall, your brain stops really quickly and sloshes, hits the front part of your head, which is a skull, hard. And then it whips backward and hits the back part of your skull. That gives you the same effect as a concussion. That is a concussion. And for example, I'm changing sports, but when Tom McHale died, his brain was all and they said he'd never had a concussion. However, he had suffered the effects of approximately 20,000 whiplash. Mm. And you look at an offensive lineman, they don't have that far to go. And so you translate that to a basketball court, you can really pick up some speed running down a court and then stopping abruptly. Doctor, can you talk a little bit about the, the players' outreach program which you've uh, put together? Uh, uh, what, what, uh, what, what, what started it, or, or actually how long have you had it, and what are some of the programs that you offer? Well, that's a big question. I appreciate your asking me. Um, it started when I addressed Congress and mentioned Jerry Eckwood, who was one of our players in the 70s. And I said I had lost Jerry. I didn't know where he was, and I wanted to find him. And when I remembered his playing years earlier, he would walk to the wrong huddle, or he would walk walked to the wrong bench, and I figured he was suffering the effects of concussion. Mm. And if what I had read recently in 2009 was true, he would have a damaged brain. So it took me several months to find him with a team of people um, helping me. We located him. And indeed, he was two weeks from being homeless. And we got him the services uh, that the NFL provided uh, for him, which he was unaware of. It took us months and months and months, but we did it. And we did it with no cost to Jerry. 
we got the paperwork done for him and the medical test done for him and everything in order, submitted it to the NFL, and now he's in an assisted living program uh, near to where his daughter lives. Um, with Jerry Eckwood was born, the Players Outreach Program, and we've since helped thousands upon thousands of players um, get the help that they deserve and that they're really not aware of. So that's how it started, and we have staff and work out of Tampa, but speak all over the country. We also have a woman's program called the Pink Ladies that informs and guides the women in these players' lives, the uh, mothers, sisters, wives, girlfriends, as to how to cope with players who are uh, concussed and need help whose personalities have changed as a result of uh, the concussion problems. I think that's great. And uh, the, the, the website is what, playersoutreach.org, doctor? Is that right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I would encourage anyone to go to that site because we also have programs on there for children. If you're a mom and your child is playing sports or getting ready for sports, we have information on there um, as well for them. Before we, uh, we let you go, Doctor, uh, obviously you... Go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say in uh, summation, uh, how many years are we talking about uh, you've been working with the program? I know you talked about the individual player, but how long does it take you to really right. organize started, and get this throughout? Yes, we started in nine, oh nine. We incorporated okay. and got our 501c3 about November of oh nine. That's great, yeah. So it's been in effect a little over two years, and uh, and you've really been able to reach out to that many people in the two-year period. That's that's pretty successful. Uh, we don't stop. I mean, I, I'll, I've taken calls at 1.30 in the morning from players who needed help. Terrific. Uh, Terrific. We're 24 hours a day. We've got a staff that is right on target and will listen to anyone that has a problem. And we've got calls from college students, and we've advised them as to what's available for college students who are having problems. But it's not just football players that are having these concussions, but that's what we deal with. Well, I congratulate you for not only writing the book, but also starting in 209 to, to develop this program, because it's obviously uh, something that is very, very necessary in this country. Well, I'll tell you, I wish we had all done this in 1920, um, and we could have prevented all of these brains. Um, from being injured. That would be my real hope. But all I can say is now that we know it, let's make sure that we use that information wisely. There's no reason to be concussed from now on. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great program you have going. And uh, as you said, uh, if you can get the, you know, the, the kids playing the, the younger the levels of football to realize that now. I know you talk about uh, teaching uh, youngsters um, when when they're injured and and the, the knowing about it and getting themselves out of the game. I think that's a big step as well. So that's that's a great great thing that you're doing. I just want to ask you one uh, question, Doctor. With you're with the Bucks for ten years. Do you, do you still follow the team at all? I follow all football. Mm -hmm. um, I I follow it all. I'm I'm a fanatic. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love college ball. I adore college ball. My season Gator tickets, and in my community, I go to Friday Night Lights. Oh, high school football, yeah. yeah. You'll see me in this. Yes, you'll see me in the stands, and I don't even have a kid I know out there playing. Um, <laughs> but I love it, and I'll tell you, in Florida, there's a kid that is a rising junior. And he's at Uly, Florida High School. And he is going to be an amazing player to watch. Last year he gained 2,000 yards, and he goes by the name Shaka, S-H-O-C-K-A, Shaka Harris. And he is an amazing player. He's somebody you really should keep your eyes on. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you got to get him to go to Florida. Well, you know, I, if I was a recruiter, I'd be at a sports event. <laughs> but this is a kid that, you know, we all talk about in the neighborhood because we all go to Friday Night Lights and we uh, sit there and cheer this kid on and we've never met him, but, you know, we, we love to watch him play. That yep. you're getting his name out there. <laughs> uh, well, I, I need to be his agent, you know. He needs to give me a little call. But honestly, um, I'd be about the 125th in line to help, help him because he's just got natural talent. Just, well, just Doctor, I, I, will natural talent. I will certainly keep an eye on him. And, and thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's nice to, uh, to have a little bit of an intelligent discussion about this subject because it has been so much in the news over the last number of years, and uh, finally somebody's going to take some action. Well, I appreciate your having me on, and, you know, like I say, I just hate to think that we're going to lose one more brain to these concussions. We've just got to wake up and figure out what we're doing. Dr. Gay Hoverhouse has been our guest. The book is called Throw Away Players, the Concussion Crisis, and the website, again, is uh, playersoutreach.org. And, uh, Doctor, appreciate you taking a few minutes, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again down the road. But uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.